Um, thank you all for coming to our session today. Um, we've already been introduced, so I can take that part out of my script. <laughs> um, so we're going to be talking about self-graded assignments in this session. The objectives that we've got for you, hopefully we can help everyone accomplish this, um, that you can identify two ways self-graded assignments have been useful in our program. We're the USU Dietetic Internship, or it might be referred to as the DI, so you can see that. Um, and also, hopefully, to think of ways or opportunities in your own courses or programs that this technique might be useful. Um, quickly, I just want to give you kind of a brief introduction to our program, because it's quite unique among other Utah State University programs. We are a distance internship, so while we are housed in the Salt Lake campus, all of our interns are nationwide. They are in every single state. We see them once a year when they come to our campus for orientation. And then we do everything online. We don't have a classroom or regular face-to-face -face interaction, so they're not seeing us on a regular basis. And since they are practicing and getting training coast to coast, they also don't interact with each other very often. We do have some interns in the same area, but it's not like they're in a class together. So face-to-face -face interaction really is limited in our program. Um, each of our interns follows a very unique schedule and they come into this internship with a unique experience. So they are getting training in certain facilities, but they're all doing this in different places, in different orders. Everyone's going to be in the same type of facility throughout their internship, but they're going to be getting or spending time in those facilities at different times. So they're getting similar experiences, but on a different time length. Um, and then everyone comes into our program with a different background. They've all completed at least a bachelor's degree from an accredited um, dietetics program at whatever school they went to. But each of those programs will address certain topics differently. So some of them will have you know, a really strong background in one topic, and then someone else will come from another program with a very strong background in another topic. So we're getting a lot of variety into our program, and we hope bring everyone together. Um, all of our courses are team taught by the three of us, which is why you get to hear from all three of us today. And uh, one other thing about our program is that we consider one intern class to follow a full academic year, a 12-month schedule, essentially. So when we talk about making updates or changes to our programs, it's only on an annual basis. We don't follow the traditional fall, spring, summer semester schedule, which I know a lot of other programs here do. So when we talk about making updates, it's really on an annual basis, um, whereas a lot of others are making them on a semester basis. OK, so in our program, um, interns are practicing to become a dietitian. So they spend time in a facility working with an actual dietitian, getting practice working with clients or patients in community settings, which could be like a WIC clinic or a health department, um, and then also clinical settings like a hospital or an outpatient setting. They're working with all of those different experiences. One thing that we are required in our internship to teach is called the Nutrition Care Process, or the NCP. It's basically um, a stepwise process to address nutritional concerns in patients or clients with their, you know, whatever condition they are experiencing. So we need to make sure our interns get experience with those and get um, training on those. And then the interns, over time, are supposed to demonstrate their competence in following that process and working with a variety of disease states. So in addition to whatever they do in their training facility as they're working with patients, you know, face-to-face -face, um, with their preceptor, the dietitian that is helping them, we also have created case studies that they do kind of as an assignment to address a different variety of disease states we want to make sure they can cover, and it gives them a chance to practice the, this nutrition care process. So these case studies are the assignments that we um, are talking about today and focusing on today. So a couple of years ago, this is how our case studies were set up. We had this process where each intern would complete six clinical-based case studies and two community-based case studies. So they're addressing different topics that might rise up in um, working with clientele in those uh, settings. And as, a, uh, as an intern went through those case studies, you know, sequentially, they would increase in difficulty. So they're kind of you know, being able to apply skills in an uh, advanced you know, manner with each one. They would uh, complete the case study, and they would submit it online in our Canvas course. And faculty would grade it. We would give them feedback and give them a final score. Um, also, students had access to all case studies at the same time. We asked them to submit one case study at a time and work on one at a time so they could um, you know, progress through those difficult stages in the sequence we intended. But they did have access to all of them simultaneously. 
as interns went through these case studies, we expected that when they got the assignment back from us that had been graded, they would very carefully and thoroughly read our comments, read our feedback, apply it to the next case study, which they diligently had not looked at until you know, they had received our feedback so they could apply it to um, you know, address whatever concerns we had brought up and you know, make improvement as they went through them. Then we would hope to see, of course, improvement of scores on their case studies over time and also um, improving their understanding of the nutrition care process. Um, one thing I did forget to mention is there's an online resource that they are re required to use um, when they're um, referring to the nutrition care process. And so in understanding the process itself, they would also show that they are using that textbook or that resource um, as they were intended. Um, so I do have a question at this point. Anyone by raise of hands, do you have assignments or concepts like this in your own programs or courses that are stepwise or very procedural or that you expect students to really get a good grasp of by the time that they finish your course. Anything like that? Okay, a few raised hands. So hopefully some of the ideas we have here will be useful for you. So this is the process that they would follow. This is just a really quick example of what they would see. This is the case study blurb that we would give to the students. Um, a lot of information about a patient, their situation, everything that they have to read. Um, this is what they would get the very first part. And then they were expected to divide that information that they received into this worksheet that is designed to help them go through each step of the nutrition care process. You can see the steps are named, nutrition assessment, nutrition diagnosis that are you know, partic particular to our discipline. And then there are certain areas that they're supposed to fill out. Um, the blank spaces is where they would be putting the information from that case study blurb, following the, the steps, and you know, this whole worksheet is organized to help them go through the process the way it's supposed to and to synthesize that information. This is what a completed case study looked like. The blue type is what the student has um, pulled from that case study and put into the worksheet. And then the red type is what faculty had um, added as they graded it. So you can see there are comments about things they did well, things they can improve on, and then faculty would also give them a final score. So this is the process as it was a couple of years ago. I'm going to turn it over to Nikki to say more about what we found at this point. So as you can see, um, I'm going to go over some scores and then talk about some of the changes that we made to implement this self-grading process. So with our community case studies, like Nicole mentioned, we just have two of those case studies. Um, interns, their scores really didn't improve very much from the first to the second. Um, we had hoped that that would happen, that as they got more exposure and they practiced, that their scores would improve, but we weren't seeing that. Um, as you can look, as you can see with the clinical ones, basically the scores stayed the same from the second case study through the sixth case study. Case study number four, you can, it's a little bit higher than the others. Um, that might, we didn't really do a lot of analysis on that. That could be because case studies one through four are fairly similar. They are a little bit more, one is more, or as you go along, one, they get more difficult, and then five and six are very different than the first four. So that could maybe be the reason by the time they got to four, they were used to it. But still, we were concerned or just surprised by the fact that their scores stayed basically the same all the way through. Even though they had repeated the process, they were using the same textbook, um, the format is the same as they go along. So we tried to come up with something that we thought might help our students um, improve. So these are some of the concerns that we, we had as we were looking at their scores. Uh, one of the big ones is that the students weren't waiting for the feedback from faculty before they moved on to the next case study. As Nicole mentioned, they had access to all of them at one time. So even though we asked them to submit it one at a time, it's very possible that they did all of them in a two week period and then just submitted them as they went along, and they didn't ever look at the feedback. That's what we were feeling was happening. Um, because they weren't looking at the feedback that we gave, and it's very detailed, uh, they weren't able to apply that and to improve and fix their mistakes on the next case study. Like I mentioned, we didn't see, we were concerned about this lack of consistent improvement, so we wanted to see more improvement as time went on. And then we also felt that they weren't using the required textbook. The textbook that they're using started out um, as an actual book that they purchased, and it's um, changed now to an online resource. And so, but it changes, it gets updated regularly, which is why it's online now. And because of those changes, we could tell when interns or our students weren't using that textbook. So this is 
a short slide to talk about the process that we use for self-grading. So we kept the case studies at six clinical and two community through the 2015-2016 year. Um, in 2016-2017, we dropped it down to four, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. We used some functions in Canvas to make um, access, to limit the access to case studies. So they only had access to one at a time. And what happened was they have to wait until it was graded before they can move on to the next case study. We also added in the self-grading component. This is where our interns would complete the case study, they would submit it, then they would get access to the answer key, and then they would compare their worksheet to the answer key and grade themselves. We gave them a very detailed rubric to follow as they were going through the um, self-grading process, and um, then they would submit that second part for faculty grading. So, um, one of the things to mention with this assignment is that it didn't necessarily decrease our workload. We're still grading as much as we were grading before, but our grading has, it hasn't increased the workload either. So we're not doing more work in order to have this assignment for us. And Canvas is really what makes this possible because of the different settings that you can change so that students don't have access to all of the assignments at once. Um, they have to achieve a certain score before they move on to the next assignment, so they do have to wait to see that feedback. So these are some of the things that we hoped would happen. Would, the first is that um, our students would review and evaluate their own work, that they would use that textbook, that they would look at our comments after they, they did their own grading, they could see the mistakes that they were making. Then they would see our comments. Sometimes they don't catch all their mistakes and so that's where our comments come in. But also when they, we would hope that um, they would see those comments and um, think back on how they can improve the next time. Um, and we also hope to see an improvement in scores. And the way we look at that is that that improvement in scores is telling us that our students are improving their understanding of the nutrition care process and that they also know how to use this textbook because it can be a little bit different to navigate an online resource rather than um, a paper textbook. So this part of the case study remained the same, just like Nicole showed earlier. This is what the changes that we made to our worksheet that the interns were using to complete this assignment. So instead of just having two columns, we added the third column, the one that says assessment score, it's the column in blue. So the intern during part one would fill out the white portions and then when they were self-grading, they would make comments on the mistakes that they made or things that they caught and deduct points. And then at the bottom you can see the scoring directions and the criteria. So we, like I said, it's very detailed, we gave them you know, it has to match as closely as possible to the answer key. There was some room for um, faculty interpretation or student interpretation. Uh, the nutrition care process isn't a prescriptive thing. It doesn't say this is exactly how you care for this type of patient, but it, it is a guideline and it's um, very specific terminology to help um, interns develop that thought process to care for these patients. This is what it looks like after the intern has graded it and after faculty has graded it. So. The comments you can see, these are actually all mine, so over in the yellow boxes are um, the faculty comments. Some of those things um, are things that I've noticed that the student didn't notice when they were self-grading, things they missed. But also, there was an opportunity in here for when a student was too hard on themselves to correct that as well. And then this is what it looks like um, at the very end. At the bottom you can see this intern has deducted points for a particular section and then there's a total score. And so theirs are in black, their comments are in black and the faculty are in red. And I'm gonna turn it over to Lacey. She's gonna talk about what we found. Thank you. Well, to ensure that this self-grading case study assignment was successful, we wanted to make sure that we continued to collect the scores of the assignments and also that we continued to evaluate those scores. So we found that the change in this assignment really did address most of our concerns and our expectations for this assignment as we progressed with this new assignment. We found that students did start utilizing the feedback that we provided to them and there was a reduced number of repeated mistakes from case study to case study, both in community and in clinical. We found that there was an increased use of text, and this was clear because not only were they using the standardized terminology, they actually began using the text to justify answers that didn't match the answer key. There was a clear improvement of scores, which we'll show you here in a moment. 
And then also some of the unsolicited feedback that we got was that the students made comments within Canvas that they had a better understanding of this nutrition care process and that they truly appreciated and enjoyed this self-grading assignment. So back to our community case study scores. So we have the 2014-2015 class, which we showed you initially, where the average score was 7.6, and we only had a 0.3 change in the scores from between case study one and case study number two. In 15 to 16, we had a 0.7 increase, and from 16 to 17, we had a 0.5 increase. So both of these show that there was a change in scores between the two case studies. One of the other things to point out here, though, is the case study number one, there was an increase in the initial score. And on top of that, we had an in improvement in scores between the two case studies. So we saw an initial change in the initial score and then an additional improvement. So we thought that that was very important. One of the things that we felt led to the initial change in the beginning score was we provided additional instruction on the nutrition care process in general and then also on how to use the standardized text because in 2015 is when it moved from the paper text to the online text. So between these two initiations of just teaching, we, we, we believe that this was slightly the reason why we saw that, that increase in the beginning. But with this, we did see an increase in scores. So here you can just kind of see that the, the trajectory between the, the yellow and between the two years of the yellow, they really did stay the same where there was kind of a and a rise between the purple and the green. We saw a more dramatic change in the clinical case studies. And remember, as we mentioned, the topics in the clinical case studies are more difficult than the topics in the community case studies. So in 2014-15, the initial year prior to initiating this assignment, again, the average score was 7.6, and we had that 0.7 increase between case study number one and case study number six. In 2015-16, we had a 1.96 point increase. And then in 2016-2017, we had a 2.4 point increase between case study number one and case study number four. And that's when we reduced the case studies. So not only did we have an even bigger increase, we saw that increase in a smaller amount of case studies as well. One of the things to point out here, though, is if you look at this first graph, we actually saw Whereas in community, we saw that initial case study increase. In clinical, we saw that initial case study decrease. And one of the reasons why we think that this might have happened is that we were stricter graders, and we started following a more precise grading rubric. So although all three of us are spending time grading these case studies, we wanted to make sure that we were, because we were having them follow specific protocols, that we were also following specific protocols to keep that consistency between all of the grading through all three faculty members. So we did see a slight decrease here, but with that, you can see between the purple year, the year that's purple and the year that's green, the trend is clearly that has increased all the way up. So moving forward, we have found that in our program that this has been very successful, and we are continuing to use this self-grading format. We have already initiated increasing the teaching related to utilizing the textbook. We do that in an orientation in the beginning of the program, but we found that the more that we introduce this textbook into our curriculum, the better they can understand and utilize that standardized terminology. It's important for us to keep evaluating our key. Obviously, we, we have about 60 students a year utilizing these keys in six different case studies, so we get a lot of feedback from them. So we take their feedback, we adjust our keys to make sure that the process is clear and concise and it flows very well for them. Also, in the worksheet that we showed, which is kind of our template that we provide to complete this assignment, we want to make sure that that also provides a very smooth flow for the students and that they're not getting caught up in any one section of that template. And then, of course, we always continue to elicit feedback from our students because we're creating this process for them. And if this process is not helping them to better understand that nutrition care process, then we need to continue to make adjustments from there. So as we've initiated this in our program, we feel that there's a lot of potential to potentially you know, put this into other disciplines as well, and into other coursework, whether it's an online program like ours or a face-to-face -face program or a blended. One of the things is when we're thinking about assignments that this might be successful for, we kind of mentioned before, it's good for assignments that students may be struggling with. 
Assignments that might build upon each other or tasks that involve repeated concepts or continual practice or something that will solve a problem. The other thing that's important that we found that was important is we were giving a lot of feedback to our students and that feedback was not being applied. So if there's an assignment in your course where you feel like you're spending a lot of time giving feedback, but maybe the feedback's not being read or it's clearly not being applied, utilizing this self-grading assignment may work well for them. And another spin on this that I know other people have used within their classrooms is grading other students' assignments. But what I found, my experience has been, again, when the student gets that assignment back, are they or are they not reading the feedback that's been provided? So these are kind of some of the assignments that we've been able to identify that self-grading may help with. So that's really an overview of what we're doing in, in our online classroom. So I wanted to just open it up for discussion. We're happy to talk about any part of this in a little bit more in, in depth. Or if you guys want to discuss just where you might see this fitting in your classrooms, we can do that as well. So I'm just going to open it up for questions and discussions at this time. Thank you. The question was, is if we put any groups together within Canvas? Not really. Um, we have discussion boards within our program, but one of the issues is, is that not only do we not follow the traditional semester system, none of our students are on the same schedule. So they're completing clinical rotations, food service management rotations, and community rotations. But we might have two students that start today, one that starts next Monday, three that start the Monday after, and then they have breaks that they can set their own breaks. So since none of them follow the same, the same guidelines or the same timeline, we can put them in groups, but it's really difficult to work on assignments in groups because they're never completing the same assignment at the same time. We have them propose questions in there, things that they're seeing within their rotations. And so we have them propose questions and then they discuss you know, more difficult or interesting topics amongst themselves about that rotation that they're in. Want to add anything to that? Um, no, I was just thinking you know, that we didn't show an example of what an answer key looks like, but the answer keys, I mean, that might I, I'm thinking the way you're asking about, you know, a, a frequently asked questions for that particular assignment. You know, having that answer key really is a good guide for those students. Um, one of the recommendations that I always give when I'm grading these assignments, if I see an area that they're struggling with, I'm, you know, they might be working on case study number three, but I tell them, keep a copy of the answer key from case study number two and number one, and you know, if you're moving on to number four, keep case study number three answer key out, because that will be a good reference for you as you move on. Um, there isn't a there isn't a lot of formal communication between our interns, um, between each other, um, between you know faculty and the intern. There's a lot, but the interns um, they don't communicate much with each other. So even if someone asked a question, I mean they do a lot of informal stuff. They have a Facebook group, but yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Yes. So this answer key, or this worksheet, if you want to go back one more, or go forward one, <laughs> right there, yeah, oh, right there, <laughs> sorry. So when they're filling out this worksheet, they can see that rubric that's listed here at the bottom. So the whole time they're working on, even the first case study, they know from the very beginning that um, the number of points that will be deducted um, for the errors that they make. So they can see that in the very beginning, and we also have we don't, this assignment doesn't have another rubric. So yeah, this is the only one, and we use the same one that the students are using. Can I add something to that? I yeah. think on our answer key as well, we've got, um, it's like color coded a little bit, so there are parts like, you have to have something that addresses what we've got in blue. It might not be the exact same words, but this is the important concept of this case study. But then we've got stuff in green that's like, other things that you might come up, or this is why that other thing that you think it might be isn't correct. So we do give them some, some guidance along those lines if we can anticipate, okay, some students might think that it's heading in this direction when it's really not, and then hopefully they'll figure that out later because it will come clear in the next step of the process. But we have our key kind of outlined that way so they can 
you know, if, if we can anticipate where errors might happen, we can explain it right there. And one more real quick thing. I know we have a couple other questions. So these assignments, like we mentioned, they complement what these students are doing in their different facilities. So our students are in hospitals and clinics and things like Nicole mentioned. So this, I'll give you, so the first case study, we have a patient who has diverticulitis. Um, and likely in the hospital before, you know, before they do this case study, they may have already seen a patient with diverticulitis. As they go on, maybe the case study patient has diabetes or has some other um, condition and they've seen some of these things or they've probably talked about some of these things with their clinical preceptors. So this, this case study isn't the first time they've ever dealt with this disease state or the first time they've ever looked at a patient's medical history and tried to determine what their nutrition issues are. So that's one of the benefits of this assignment is they're learning things um, practically in their, in their um, facilities and then they're using those skills to practice this nutrition care process. And they're using the nutrition care process at their facilities as well. So, yeah. So how does the rubric for this year feed back to students? Are you very specific? Like, are you at least at a more, is it a small level, finite, or do you guys present our overall concept level feedback to the students? I would say both. Mm -hmm. It just really depends on, you know, we're reading every single piece of their assignment that they've turned in. So it might be something conceptual. So one of the things that they have to do is they have to determine what the diagnosis is. And so part of that might be conceptually, you know, they might pick this diagnosis and they're really, really far off. Or they might be really, really close to the diagnosis and so our feedback is much more detailed. Like you almost are where you need to be at because you have to support the diagnosis with signs and symptoms. And so that might be really, really minute and detailed versus something that is, is big picture wise. So we bo do both of those things when we're giving feedback. So we use Canvas. Um, what we realized as we were putting together a presentation is that Canvas changed their look like a couple <laughs> months ago. So yeah. this looks, this is the old way that Canvas looks. Um, but yeah, we use Canvas. So our interns are using just, a, it's just a Word document that they're using and that rubric is on the Word document. But then when we're grading it, we're grading it in Canvas. They're uploading a PDF. We only allow them to upload PDFs. So they upload a PDF. And then we use the Canvas tools to make comments. So now on Canvas, we're highlighting things and we're adding comments in different ways. But we're always using this within Canvas. Chuck? So what is the grade that you have? So I mean, is it based on uh, the, the last one you do? Or did you go for the best? Or what, what, what do you, what's your approach uh, uh, to that? We have a minimum grade that they can get. If they don't get that minimum grade, they're going to have to complete another case study. But it's kind of cumulative. Obviously, all of these grades go into their total grade at the end. So, you know, as long as they're getting a majority of the assignments, I've definitely had experiences where people are completely missing the boat on something, and I've asked them to do additional work. It doesn't happen often, but if they're really not getting a disease state, then I might have them do additional work. But most of the time they're getting, they're really just missing small things or if we find is they, that's the reason we want them to be able to progress through these. So as they progress through these, we're showing that their knowledge of disease states and the, in, in the entire process improves. And as long as they get to the end of these assignments and they have a general understanding and they really can't apply these concepts, then in a, in a sense, you know, they're passing that competency because all of our curriculum is based specifically on competencies. As long as they're past competencies and, and we feel like they've, they're meeting those requirements. Something else I'll add is that um, if we've got a student as they're completing this um, and we're grading it and we're, we can tell that they really are missing the boat, they really do not understand, um, we offer the opportunity for them to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with one of the three of us and um, we'll talk about things um, and that often is the clarification that that student needs to improve. Um, I can think of more than, a, more than a handful of students that I've had um, a meeting with and afterward their next case study they've done uh, much better. So, Like maybe they weren't paying attention to when we talked about where to find the terminology and there's terminology sheets within the textbook and we have an online meeting with them and we point out well are you going to the terminology sheets and they're like oh 
I didn't know that that's where those were. Or that and they have a specific definition for the terminology or things like that. Or you have to read the whole sheet, not just like the first sentence on the sheet. A lot of those little things are big clarifiers for our students. Any other questions? The rubric is on the worksheet. So as they're completing the worksheet, the rubric's right there in blue, right in front of them. So I have occasionally thought, did they change something? But they have to submit the initial assignment first. So in Canvas, they submit what they've completed initially. And then that automatically opens up the answer key. And they can access the answer key, and then they can go in and self-grade their assignment. So they actually submit two different assignments for this. The initial, app, the initial submission that's ungraded, which releases the answer key, and then a secondary submission that they, that they grade. They do, have, they do have an example of what a completed one should look like that has nothing to do, it hasn't been graded by anyone, it's what theirs should look like. Um, so that could potentially add to, but a lot of this is so detailed, I think that's where some of the, some things get missed. Not specifically in this assignment, but in all of their rotations, they complete a reflection. And really this process, the nutrition care process, is such a huge part of the curriculum. You couldn't avoid it if you tried in our program. <laughs> so I think a lot of them do, and that's kind of where I mentioned like those unsolicited feedback, like they will mention in the comments that they understand the process better or something specifically in this assignment that's helped, or just that they really like the opportunity to reflect back to see what they should have done differently even prior to it coming to us. Because I think it's easier for them to look through that and say, oh, oh, okay, I see what I should have done here. Instead of just coming to us, you know, we're putting the red ink all over it or the comment boxes. And there's something a little bit different about getting that feedback initially than realizing your mistakes, being able to kind of, like you said, reflect on that and then having it come to faculty for additional feedback.